Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming back to the channel, John McHugh. Hi, John. How are you? I'm great, Esoteric. Thank you so much for, for having me on. And um, I look forward to discussing uh, how cuneiform puns inspired some of the bizarre Greek constellations and asterisms. Very interesting title. Uh, yeah, go for it. Please talk us through it. Okay. So, yeah, so um, I'd like to do a screen share, if, that, if that'll work for everybody. So I'm going to go do that right now. And uh, I will try to simplify linguistics as best I can so that everyone is not feeling confused. Because <laughs> the linguistics can be really complicated. You should see the book now, The Celestial Code of Scripture. Yeah, so um, my name is John McHugh. I'm the author of The Celestial Code of Scripture, the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. And um, as, as the subtitle implies, um, if I had to summarize what the book is about, it's basically uh, while I was a graduate student, I stumbled onto an arcane celestial thinking paradigm unlike anything we embrace today. This esoteric doctrine held that the constellations depicted still frames of all the monumental incidents that had taken place on Earth. Alternate readings for the cuneiform signs that were, uh, that were used to spell out the oldest constellation titles in each tableau divulged the details and the action that was taking place in each astral scene. Hence, in the ancient world, the constellations de depicted an infallible repository of mythical history, which cuneiform sources refer to as heavenly writing or constellation writing. Religious astrologers such as the Magi that followed the star of Bethlehem to baby Jesus arranged the jumbled array of stellar snapshots and their accompanying missives into narratives, which were then recorded as history pagan in pagan religious mythology in the Bible and in the Quran. So, the stories that can be exposed to these stellar picture stories and hidden encryptions are Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Noah's flood and ark, Samson's slaughter of a thousand men with a donkey's jawbone, Jonah's three-day confinement in the sea monster's belly, Jesus' virgin birth and sea walk, John's woman, child, and dragon vision in Revelation 12, St. Christopher, the giant who carried Jesus across a dangerous river, and the Islamic claim that the Quran was based on a celestial tablet in heaven. And actually the title of that tablet, which is Al-Qadan, the recital. So the constellations are literally still frames, snapshots of scenes from religious history of the Jews, the Christians, Muslims, and of the pagans. So because the constellations depicted deified characters and props from sacred history, these secret encryptions, or what we, we today would call wordplay in the constellations' oldest titles, defined how they should be depicted in the heavens. This is how many of the bizarre constellations and asterisms rose into the sky. As a, as a historian of the constellations, I get this question all the time. Um, how come the constellations don't look like they're supposed to? And, and the reason is because many of them are based on wordplay. And that'll come up in this slideshow. So um, the, the article is based on um, a, 2000, uh, a 2016 Archaeoastronomy and Ancient Technologies article that was published. And by that title on the screen that I read initially, how can you form puns inspired some of the bizarre Greek constellations and asterisms. And what I mean by that is this. So, Aries, you think of it as like just a ram, right? Well, Aries is a golden fleeced flying ram. I mean, that's what it did in, in religious mythology. And um, when people look at their horoscope, people born under Aries don't often think of what the iconic uh, feat that this particular ram performed in uh, sacred scriptures. Another one, Crater. It's a wine bowl constellation, but it's positioned, it's sitting on the back of the water snake, Hydra or Hydra. I always pronounce it in Greek, it's Hydra in Greek. So uh, 
There is a picture of it on the second cent century Farnese astral globe. You can see that that wine jug right there is crater. Pegasus is a flying horse who's isn't a, it's not a, uh, an intact horse. It's cut off at the belly button. So why is Pegasus a flying horse cut off at the navel? Like, what the heck? You know, it sounds absurd when you start thinking about it. Another one that fascinates me, I'm, I'm a cancer on July 21st is my birthday. So um, the crab, it, it's your prototypical crab, but it has a feeding trough and two donkeys on its back. Uh, the Messier object, the star cluster M44 is, is a, a feeding trough, a manger. And the third and fourth brightest stars in Cancer are the donkeys that are eating from the feeding trough. What the heck is that about? And then Argo, it's a backward turned ship that's missing its prow. The whole front of the boat is cut off, as you can see on our Farnese star atlas. And again, that's an ancient star atlas. Uh, it's in, I forget what museum in Italy it's in, but... Um, but you can see the bow is cut off of the ship right there in the picture as if by scissors. And uh, the constellations are depicted as if the gods are looking down onto earth. So uh, west is to our left and east is to our right. So when the Argo crosses the sky and goes from east to west, it's always backwards turn. It's leading with its stern with the back of the boat um, and no one's ever been able to figure out why the heck that is um, and I'm going to show you why that is in a few minutes so if you had to talk into you know, constellation origins I, I I do feel kind of proud about this because it's it's taking a lot of work to find these word plays so um, everything you see is my own blood sweat and tears and I, I get it if people have a problem with it but um, if you read the article uh, in Archaeoastronomy and Ancient Technologies, it's footnoted for the scholar, past peer review, and all that stuff. So you, you can see that I got an argument to make. So 48 of our constellations appear in uh, uh, Claudius Ptolemy's uh, Almagest, and that dates to about the middle of the second century, right? They're called the Ancient 48, and about half of them are direct correlates with the Mesopotamian constellations. Uh, constellations like, for instance, um, you know, much of the zodiac. So like Taurus the bull, uh, you know, uh, Leo the lion, Scorpius. Half of these 48 constellations make direct correlations with uh, their original title in Mesopotamia. And the other half appear to be uh, indigenous Hellenic inventions. Um, so again, we're focusing on the flying golden fleeced ram, the wine bowl position on the water snake's back, the feeding trough and two donkeys on Cancer's shell, and the ballast backwards turned Argo. So uh, regarding constellation origins, um, for instance, one expert, a guy named E.C. Krupp, writes that uh, the constellations are an anthology of cultural diffusion episodic accumulation, historic invention, and, a pat and patchwork adaption define um, the, the night sky gallery aesthetic. So he's saying that it was purely diffusion through which the constellations of Mesopotamia emerged in the Greek sky, which was readopted almost intact by the Romans, which we have today in our own night sky. Now, with the age of exploration, new constellations were added, but those original ones were the ancient 48. Another expert in the history of astronomy, a guy named John Rogers writes that many of our constellations were in fact unknown in Mesopotamia. So we're forced to conclude that the classical sky map was synthesized from several unrelated sources. I hate to break the news to you, but that's not right. I'm gonna show you how wordplay inspired transformations in constellations titles when they were adopted from Mesopotamia into the Greek world. So the theory is, you know, there, there's the uh, an ancient map, right? You see Mesopotamia there. You see Syria along the, the uh, western 
the Western Mediterranean. It says Levant, it's, the Levant is the geographical area, but the Syrian coast is where the Phoenicians had inhabited. And one theory is that the Phoenicians were avid traders with Mesopotamia and with the Greek and Roman world. So that these Mesopotamian constellations moved into Phoenicia and the Phoenicians shared them with Greek through trade. And in fact, it's the Phoenician alphabet that is adopted by the Greeks. And that's based on the cuneiform alphabet from Ugarit. Yeah, so, um, and also the, the, uh, the alphabet that appears in uh, the Sinai Peninsula in the, uh, I guess the early second millennium BC. And it's alphabetic writing. So to get an understanding of how these bizarre constellations and asterisms show up, you have to understand the worldview of the Mesopotamian astrologer. An astrologer and astronomer was interchangeable in the ancient world. So I'll use the term interchangeably. Literally the title of an astrologer is Tupsharu, which is a writer or an author. And the reason it's writer or author is because um, Mesopotamian astrologers viewed the stars and constellations as heavenly writing. The terms for it are right there. Uh, Shatir Shameh, which means, you know, writing of the sky. Shatir Barume, which means celestial writing. Uh, Shatir Ti Shamami, which again, which would translate like, like writing of the heavens. Uh, again, that's what a Mesopotamian astrologer is picturing the star as, the, the, the constellations and stars as. And they actually use a term uh, rarely, but it's referred to in a couple cases of Lamashi writing, constellation writing. It's this secret cryptic script in which a picture is seen as a still frame and secret encryptions in the cuneiform spelling of that still frame reveal word plays that are seen as revelations. And, you know, the, these deep, deep sharo, these, these scholars who, these occult scholars, they're the authors of the, the tale of Atrahasis, uh, which is, it's the oldest flood story, the oldest creation myth and flood story. The Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, is written by an exorcist um, who's also got a specialty in astrology. Um, Anuma Elish, same thing. These are the, their, their authors are what we would call astrologer scholars, astrologer magicians. The other thing they're fluent in and expert in is these Sumerian Akkadian dictionaries, literally two different languages. And they're, so if you were uh, an ancient Mesopotamian astrologer, you were all automatically bilingual. You knew the archaic language of Sumerian and you knew your own spoken tongue, which is Akkadian. Akkadian's the language of the Babylonians and the Assyrians. So, <sighs> Mesopotamian astrologers, they read the heavenly writing as if it were a text, which is why their title means writer or author. And then they would decode this text, looking for signs of imminent earthly events that could be avoided or exploited. You know, uh, capacious cattle yields and, and uh, uh, barley yields, uh, an assassination attempt on the king or queen, those kind of things. That's what they're trying to see. But one of the things that we just don't get today is when they find what we would call a word play, they perceive it as a revelation, literally an ultimate truth, inviolable truth, a, tr a truth that is uh, unquestionable. It is infallible, ultimate truth about the nature of the universe. And, you know, one example of that is when Jesus says to Peter, he says, you are a rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. You know, well, Peter's name means rock or stone. It means a small rock or stone on which the, bed, the bedrock of the church is going to be built. And Jesus and the Roman Catholic Church interpret that pun as uh, the office of papacy, the office of the papacy that, that Peter would become the first pope. That's a pretty big deal. So what ancient astrologers and other forms of diviners in the ancient world constantly refer to is they write, 
which are hidden words, which are what we would call puns or polysemy, which means multiple meanings in a word or phrase. You might think of it as double entendre. Amat Natsirti, hidden words, are the Paris to Shali, they're the secrets of the gods. And when you find a pun, it is so important and so sacred and so solemn that you it's accompanied with an admonition. This is a secret of the great scholar or the great gods. The uninitiated shall not see it. Sometimes it says a secret of the, the scholar or the expert. The uninitiated cannot see it because it would be spiritually dangerous if an uninitiated person understood the powers of a certain deity. So the reason for this is simply that writing was considered, this is Scott Nogle, one of the great uh, scholars uh, regarding uh, punning in the ancient world. He writes uh, one of his website commentaries from um, almost two decades ago. He writes that writing was considered of divine origin. Puns provided diviners with interpretive strategies. Words were considered the embodiment of the object or the idea they represented. Individual words contained the power of essence. There was a whole envelope of information that came with every cuneiform sign or part of a word. And the punning he's referring to there is cuneiform punning because every cuneiform sign that's used as a syllable also has other meanings. So puns become incredibly prevalent in cuneiform writing. So how this, the pervasiveness of punning in cuneiform writing occurs is, is due the, to the evolution of cuneiform writing. So cuneiform writing is polysemous, meaning multiple meanings in a word or phrase. It's polysemous because of the way it evolved. The Sumerian invent, the, the Sumerians of Southern Mesopotamia, they invent cuneiform writing to write their Sumerian language in around 3000 BC. However, they're sharing Southern Mesopotamian with another ethnicity. This ethnicity speaks another language, a Semitic language called Akkadian, um, which is later the language of the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Okay. The Akkadian speaking peoples retain the Sumerian words through Sumerian logograms. And for the esoteric thoughts viewers, when you think of a Sumerian logogram, just think of it as Sumerian word, okay? It's used written with a certain cuneiform sign or series of signs. So Mesopotamian astrologers are studying these lexicons, these bilingual dictionaries uh, that, that give Sumerian logograms and their Akkadian, which is their Babylonian and Assyrian equivalent meaning, okay? So for instance, you look at that cuneiform sign right there. In Sumerian, that's this cuneiform sign for sky or heavens. It's read on. It can also be read dingir, which means God in Sumerian. Uh, now remember, if I were a Babylonian astrologer, I would know that that Sumerian word, that Sumerian cuneiform sign can be read on skies, or it can be read in dingir, God. But I would read it as my spoken language. I'd say, oh, this cuneiform sign means shamu, skies or heavens. It can also mean ilu, which is my word for God, my Babylonian or Assyrian word for God. Okay. However, that cuneiform sign means a whole bunch of other words in the Akkadian language of the Babylonians and Assyrians. So that cuneiform sign means shamu, skies or heavens. It means ya'au, mind, belonging to me. It means kakabu, star. It means shibultu, ear of barley. It means zukupu, to impale. It means sha, of. It means asaku, tabu. It means ilu, God. So when you write this one cuneiform sign, it has that whole array of meanings that you see on your screen right there. And when a Mesopotamian astrologer finds a pun, they're looking at it as a form of revelation. So that's one form of punning. The other form is through just an astonishing number of homophones, words that have uh, the same pronunciation but different meanings, okay? And there's thousands of them in cuneiform writing. And for instance, if you were writing the word for a star, you could write it many, many ways. You, you see six different ways to write the cuneiform sign mul, 
Mul just means star, or you could render it constellation in Sumerian. However, that cuneiform reading of Mul means Kakabu in Akkadian, which is star or constellation. It's in front of every star and constellation depicted in the heavens when you write out the titles of the constellations. So there's a Mul. There's another homophone called Mul too. In fact, there, there are so many homophones that the linguists had to invent a transliteration scheme that allowed scholars to understand which cuneiform sign is actually appearing on a tablet. So there's the mul sign, mul one doesn't have a subscript. There's a mul two, there's a mul three, there's a mul four, there's a mul five, and there's a mul x, which is an esoteric form that doesn't show up in the Sumerian and Akkadian dictionaries. So all of these render kakabu, star or constellations. But here's the problem. Every one of those cuneiform signs has alternate readings and alternate meanings. So when you write the cuneiform sign mul, it has a whole vast array of alternate readings and meanings. So when you write the cuneiform sign that can be read mul, it can mean star, constellation, god, shining brightly, inscription, writing, arrow, foundation, ornament, pierce, wood wasp, workhorse, distant time, fruit, filling elated, field, cow, moon, and month. And, and that's just some of them. There's actually more. So to say the least, cuneiform writing embodied an astonishing amount of double tundra. And when a pun was discovered by a, a scholar magician, they'd often write some kind of uh, chastisement or you know, admonition. Secret of the great gods, the uninitiated shall not, shall not see it because it could be spiritually dangerous. So the best, this is best exemplified in a Numenilish, the Babylonian Assyrian creation myth, Numenilish Tablet 7. And in Tablet 7, you get 50 epithets for the, the supreme Mesopotamian deity named Marduk. His uh, aspect is, he's an embodiment in Jupiter, the planet god Jupiter. And the astrologer scholars utilize polysemy and Marduk's 50 epithets to produce all 163 lines from that text. So this is a picture of Marduk right here, Marduk Jupiter, right? So Enuma Elish, uh, tablet seven, line 128, it literally just says, the god Nibiru, his star, which in the skies they cause to appear. Nibiru just means the crossing, the junction is maybe the best way to translate it. It refers to Jupiter when it stands at the meridian and is crossing the midpoint of the sky. So it even has an astronomical uh, meaning to the title. So that's how you would write it. You'd write it Mul Dingir Nibiru. Mul, you know, star. And remember, you could write it with six different Mul signs, whatever one you felt like, right? And then Dingir, it's a deity, so you'd write Dingir. These are, these are, we don't have this in English. They're determinative, they're noun markers. So the first noun marker lets me know this is a star. Second noun marker lets, says this isn't anything mundane, this is a deity. And then the, the third title is Nibiru, crossing, junction. It's Marduk when he's crossing the midpoint of the sky, the, the meridian. So that's how you would write it in cuneiform. You could write it the Multu sign, Dean Gear. Nebiru, right there on your screen, right? So, um, so when you look at that, um, what the Mesopotamian astrologer authors did is they said, oh, there's a whole bunch of other meanings to those, that astronomical title from, our, from Marduk Jupiter, okay? And it has, so Multu, although it means star or constellation, it can also mean they cause to appear. Dingir, we just saw, meant Iluga. It can mean Kakabu star. It can also uh, be read An, which, which you just saw means skies. The Ne2 sign isn't used for anything for some reason. The cuneiform sign B that you see right there can represent the word Shu, which means his in the Babylonian Syrian language. And Ru can mean, uh, uh, it can mean uh, Ina, and um, and uh, Ina and Shah. Um, 
So you end up with, um, so you end up with this wordplay right there. They just write down these wordplays to form a coherent sentence. And that coherent sentence says, uh, so um, it should say, Dingir Nibiru Kakabu Shu Ina Sha. I think I forgot to put the Sha there. Um, Ina Sha Shame Ushapu, which means the God crossing his star, which in the skies they cause to appear. And that's literally how line 128 is comprised. But they're doing that from wordplay on all 50 of the epithets. They're just breaking apart the, the titles of the, of the astronomical uh, names for Marduk. And they're render it, rendering the puns as revelations that become, you know, uh, tablet seven of a numeration. So, and you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, this is one of the greatest scholars uh, in cuneiform uh, writing that has ever existed, A.R. George. He writes, in the ancient cuneiform scholarship, the writing of a name can be adapted to impart information about the nature and function of its bearer. Babylonian scholars themselves were fond of this, of the speculative interpretation of names in particular. This was not a trivial pursuit, but a means of, of revealing profound truth about the nature and function of deities and their attributes. Okay, so here's an example of one of the most profound puns that shows up in ancient Near East in cuneiform writing. Shameh, Shameh. Shameh is just the genitive and accusative case spelling of skies or heavens. It's based on the idea that you can break apart Shameh, skies or heavens, and it can mean Shah of, and may just means water. It's accusative and uh, uh, genitive case spelling for water, right? So literally what you get is skies are comprised or means of water. It's the idea that the skies are made up of water and that's how you get rain. The skies are blue and they trickle down uh, precipitation, right? And then right after they discover this pun, they write a secret of the scholar, the uninitiated shall not see it. And you might say, well, that's pretty interesting cuneiform writing. Well, that's the basis of Genesis one verses six and seven. There we have, and God said, let there be a firmament between the waters to separate the waters from waters. So God's made the firmament and separated the waters under the firmament from the waters above it. And it was so, God's called the firmament skies. And that's where you get the idea that there's waters in the skies and there's waters on earth. It comes right out of a Mesopotamian wordplay. So an example of this, you know, so, our hedra, our water snake constellation. Hedra just means water serpent, right? So the one of the Mesopotamian titles, one of the Sumerian titles for this star figure is Mush'aba. It literally means sea serpent or water serpent. It's literally rendered as hedra. Whoever translated that knew Sumerian. They understood that, wait, this is a sea serpent or a large body of water serpent. And that in, uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, that's what it was spelled. Well, we're going to render that right into Greek as Hydra, the water serpent. So, uh, by the way, another term, I just want to share this with your viewers, uh, esoteric thoughts viewers. Another term for Hydra is, uh, in Mesopotamia, is Mushush. It means red dragon. And that's where you get the red dragon of Revelation 12. So the, north, the, western, the northwestern stars of Virgo, are joined up with Coma Berenices and Leo's tail to form a pregnancy goddess, a, a pregnant woman constellation. And Regulus is the, the anointed child star, the Christ child star. And, uh, you know, and Hedra is called the red dragon. One of its titles, and not just water snake, it's also the red dragon or the red serpent. And that's what shows up in Revelation 12. This tableau becomes the basis for Revelation 12 verses one through six, the red dragon child and the pregnant woman. Um, and we can do a show on that if you want to. But um, so, um, so how did the Mesopotamian hired worker constellation transfigure into Aries the ram? So it, 
you know, because Aries isn't just some ram. It's a it's a special ram. It's a flying ram, and it carries uh, the the children Phrixus and Hele uh, on its uh, on one of its uh, on one of its trips, and Hele falls in. Uh, so anyway, so in Mesopotamia, you know, uh, Aries isn't a ram. It's a hired worker. It's spelled out, as you can see right there, Luhunga, the man, hired worker. Lutu is just the, it's a determinative for male professions, right? It's got a plow up there. Triangulum is the plow, triangulum constellation. And the field is the Pegasus square. That's the field it's, this hired worker is destined to till. However, cuneiform writing is really cumbersome. Carrying around a wet, moist clay tablet, you got a stylus and you got to inscribe all those you know, all those wedges in there. Uh, you can see all the wedges that got to go in to write Luhunga. So they're constantly trying to abbreviate. So one of the ways they want to abbreviate is to the first cuneiform sign. So Luhunga, they were trying to abbreviate it as Lutu. However, you, <laughs> grammatically, you don't read, you don't read determinatives. They don't have a phonetic equivalent. You you can't read them in the same way if I wrote the word phone, there's a silent E at the end of the word phone. And we know it's part of the word, but you don't read it. So they they can't use the Lu2 sign as abbreviation. So they use the Lu1 sign. Now, the reason that that's intriguing is the Lu1 sign is also the cuneiform sign that means ram. And that's how the hired worker gets transfigured into a ram. And everybody everyone who knows the history of the, of the Mesopotamian, uh, of the Greek constellations and how they arrived from Mesopotamia knows this. However, what they often don't go into is that there's more to the pun. Lu, the cuneiform sign there that means ram, can also be read C. And C is the Sumerian logogram that means to become. So you get this pun that says the hired worker becomes the ram. Okay, well, that's kind of cool. But there's more to the pun. When you look at, up at the hired worker up there, um, that also means ram. That cuneiform sign up at the top of your screen is a composite sign. It's a square cuneiform sign, which is the lagab sign. Lagab can also mean to fly around or flying. And that cross cuneiform sign in the middle of lagab that you see in the top of your screen is the bar sign. And bar is just a cuneiform sign, a Sumerian word that means gold, and it also means fleece. So then you write down all the wordplay and you get the hired worker becomes the flying gold fleeced ram. And you're like, ah, oh, there's your gold fleeced ram. Because it, no one ever saw a golden flying fleeced ram flying around in, in Mesopotamia or in Greece or in Rome or anywhere else, right? But it's, it's based on the idea that a word plays our revelation. Now, I, I go into this in the book, The Celestial Code of Scripture, um, and I also go into it in one of, um, I can't remember what article it is, but the whole dunama of the uh, Golden Fleece's voyage, uh, I think it's the Colchis, where it carries, uh, carries Phrixus and Hele on its back. It's a flying ram, it's Golden Fleece, it carries, Phrixus is just the word for curly, and Hele is, they're all up there as puns, and I go into to it in the book, um, and so you get the dunuma dun there, you get a flying, the flying gold fleeced ram carries Phrixus or curly and Hele, Hele falls into the sea, um, and that's all based on the full title, the full Mesopotamian title of Aries, Mululukunka, and there's all the puns right there. So again, if you said a hired worker becomes the flying golden free strand, that doesn't make any sense. And the reason historians of astronomy are trying to make logical arguments that are founded in scientific data. And the problem is that the authors of ancient uh, religious mythology, what we would call scripture, are not encumbered by science. They believe that amat that hidden words or puns, are Paris to Charlie, they're the secrets of the gods. And if you believe that, then these word plays can therefore transform a hired worker into 
a flying golden fleeced ram that we know today as Aries. Okay, how did the Mesopotamian field constellation morph into a flying course cut off at the navel? Again, it's right there. Um, we go back to that still frame of the hired worker and his plow and the field he's destined to uh, till there. The field constellation is the Pegasus Square, right? Well, in Mesopotamia, there's a picture of it in the, the Egyptian cow of, of Den, calendar of star calendar of Dendera. So they don't depict it as Pegasus. They depict it as a field constellation, right? So the Aku constellation in Mesopotamia just means field. It's a Sumerian title that means field. However, in the archaic, the most archaic form of spoken Greek, which is Mycenaean, Iku renders horse. And just so you know, the U is often rendered O. Cuneiform U is, is often rendered into Greek as, as O because it's Iku and O can be a, om, Omicron can be a. So Iku, Iku, field becomes horse, but there's a whole bunch more puns because that might explain how it becomes a, poor, a, a horse. But another way to write the field constellation is Ashiku. It literally means one field because Iku is a form of surface area similar to the English acre. It's a 60 meter square uh, plot of land. And Ash means one, but it can also be read Dal, and Dal is the uh, cuneiform term for flying, to fly around. So you write down all the puns and you get Dal can mean ash, which can, which can mean be read dal, means flying in Sumerian. Iku is the archaic Greek word for horse. Iku, it was broken into cuneiform syllables, e and ku. Ku can mean cut off. Ku can also be read door, which means navel. So you, you just write down all the puns and it just becomes pretty easy. And I go into this into the article. I, you know, I footnote all the, all the, uh, the word plays, but so ku can mean a uh, cut off and it can also mean navel. So you write down all the puns, you get a flying horse cut off at the navel, right? Well, that doesn't really make any sense logically. Um, first of all, we don't usually see flying horse flying around the night sky, right? Um, but again, if you're looking for wordplay, if hidden words, if polysemy or double entendre are the secrets of the gods, then it's right there, right in front of you, all in wordplay for, for the cuneiform terms for the Aku constellation, which initially was a field constellation. And that's how a flying horse was cut off at the navel. Again, it, it sounds absurd. It absolutely sounds absurd. And unless you're thinking like a Mesopotamian astrologer, and then wordplays mean everything. In the same way that Jesus looked at Peter and he said, you are rock and on this rock, I will build my church. So here's one of my favorite ones. How did the wine bowl emerge on the back of the water serpent Hedra? So, so Crater is this wine jug and it's on the back of Hedra. And there's a picture of it on one of the European star atlases, but it, it harkens back to Mesopotamia. It's the same constellation. Um, so, I'm going to give you the whole, all of them. So Hedra has a, a raven pecking at its tail as if it's trying to eat at its entrails, right? So one of the titles for uh, the raven constellation, again, raven is also an ancient Mesopotamian constellation. One of its titles is Sheer Boar. So you could write it Dingir Sheer Boar. By the way, it's the embodiment of this, the storm god, Adad or Hadad. I think it's Teshub and Hittite. This is the storm god. Raven embodies that storm god. So he's a deity. Remember, name means Elu, but remember that Dingir sign also represents the word Shah in Akkadian, which is a uh, sheer. It, one of the raised, ways to write sheer is with the Mush sign, which means serpent in Sumerian. And you're like, oh, wait, and the Bor sign, well, Bor means. Nasahu in the Babylonian Assyrian language, it's a verb. It means to tear out parts of the body or the extra. So you write down the puns and you're like the raven tears out the body parts of the serpent. 
Then you turn to the, you know, Aratus in Phenomena, which is the earliest recorded, uh, you know, Greek reference to Raven, right? If he says, on its, uh, on Hedra's middle coil lies the bowl, and on the last one, the last coil, is the figure of a raven that looks like one pecking at the coils. And there it is on uh, the Farnese Star Atlas. You can see the raven right there on your screen, pecking at Hedra. Douglas Kidd writes that, you know, so then he goes on, he tries to explain the uh, origin of the bowl. He says that it appears to not have been known to the Babylonians since two of its stars, Alpha and Beta, were included in Mush. Remember the, the serpent constellation that we call Hedra. It was probably invented by the Greeks, presumably before Eudoxus, circa 360 BC. Now remember, Crater is a large wine bowl. It's a large bowl in which wine was mixed with water. It's a wine bowl. So I'm saying that Douglas Kidd's ex claim that Crater wasn't known in Mesopotamia is absolutely wrong. Here's why. So when you look at the Hedra constellation, it's Mush Aaba. It's a sea serpent or a water serpent. It's literally translated that way. It's translated right out of the cuneiform, Sumerian cuneiform, as Hudra, the water serpent, right? Well, here's how you'd write it if you were writing a, in a star atlas. You could write Multu, again, remember, they're not writing the two sign. That's a modern scholarly designation. They're writing Mul, Dingir, Mush Aaba. Constellation God Water Serpent, right? Well, Multu means constellation, but it also stands for the Akkadian verb amedu to place something upon something else. Dingir, which means God, also means Sha, which is of. Mush, which Teru, which is serpent. It's also the serpent is that same exact word is also a wine bowl in ancient Mesopotamia. And it also means literally the word for back, as in your back or my back, right? And Aab is just a Sumerian term for sea. So all of a sudden you get place the wine bowl upon the back of the water serpent. That's how crater gets placed on the back of a water serpent, how you get this absolutely asinine imagery. Why in God's name would you put a wine jug on the back of a water serpent? Because it is encrypted as wordplay in the stars. And remember, hidden words are the secrets of the gods, and you can see the wine jug there on the back of Hedra. That's probably how the wine bowl merged into the heavens. So one of my favorites, uh, why did a feeding trough and two donkeys suddenly, suddenly emerge on the shell of cancer? Okay, that doesn't even make sense. You've got two donkeys and a feeding trough on the back of a crab shell. And you're like, what in God's name could that be connected to, right? Well, the oldest title for uh, cancer for our crab constellation is crab. It's alul in Sumerian, alutu in Akkadian. They literally mean crab. It's one to one. Then about 600 BC, they start using the term kushu for cancer. And the reason that that's, that's ambiguous because kushu is listed in those Sumerian Akkadian dictionaries. It's listed uh, between sea creatures, uh, between turtles and crabs in sea, in sea creatures. So in, so in some instances, you, could config, you can consider it a crab. In other instances, you could consider it like a snapping turtle. Uh, uh, a shelled sea creature that lives in the mud like a crab does, okay? So the reason that that becomes interesting is, you know, so you got kushu, it's, am, it's am, ambiguous, it can mean turtle, it can mean crab, starts showing up around six, 600 BC. So kushu, turtle or crab, is a synonym for a term that's morguba, Literally, the term means, morgu means back, carapace, or back of the ba, which is a turtle. Morgu ba, shell of the turtle. But what it functions as, these big snapping turtles function as uh, feeding troughs. They just 
kill the turtle, they clean it out, and they use it as a feeding trough for for donkeys, you know? So all of a sudden you have Kushu, which is our cancer, being equated with a turtle shell that is used as a feeding trough. And you're like, oh, that would explain how a uh, Messier object M44 on cancer becomes uh, the feeding trough, the manger asterism in cancer, right? So more guba, turtle, turtle shell. But if you equate it with kushu, you could think of a turtle shell as also being a crab shell because of the ambigu ambiguousness of kushu, the kushu sign, right? So kushu, turtle crab, it's a synonym with morguba, which means feeding trough. And the morgu portion of that, uh, that Sumerian title, it means back of the shoulder, literally in specific places in the back of the shoulders and neck. It's a specific place on your back. It's where, right where your neck and your shoulders kind of meet in the middle of your back. And that's exactly where this feeding trough shows up. So the feeding trough shows up uh, between the shoulders and the neck of cancer the crab. So how do the donkeys show up? Well, one of the way, there's four different ways to write kushu in cuneiform. One of them is the kushu one sign. Uh, there it is right there. It's a composite sign. It embodies the mon sign, which just means the number two, and the gear three sign, which just means donkey. And in Sumerian, a, sing, a singular, singular noun can stand for the plural, it can stand for collective. So you get two donkeys. And so all of a sudden, when you write down all the puns, if you were writing down a star title, you could write constellation god crab. So literally it's, you know, Multu, Dingir, Kushu. And when you write down all of the word plays, you get place the feeding trough, two donkeys between the shoulders of the crab. And they understand that Kushu, a synonym for it is, you know, Morguba, which means between, between the shoulders and it's a feeding trough. And that's probably how the wordplay placed the feeding trough and two donkeys between the shoulders of the crab. That's probably how you get uh, the fatne, which is the manger asterism, the feeding trough asterism, and the two donkeys that are on the back of the, of the crab shell of cancer. Again, doesn't make any sense. It's not logical unless you believe that hidden words are the secrets of the gods. And if you believe hidden words are the secrets of the gods, well, then it's just right there. You know, the feeding trough and two donkeys are placed between the shoulders of the crab because uh, the cuneiform sign mul tu can also mean to place. I mean, it can mean a medu in Akkadian, which means to place. So how did the Argo lose its bow and why is it backwards turned, right? So, when you look at Argo, how it appears in the night sky is exactly as you see it on the screen. That's a sketch from the Farnese Star Atlas. It literally moves across the sky from east to west backwards turned. The stern is leading, does not make any sense whatsoever. It's absolutely absurd, right? And when you look at, so there is a boat constellation in ancient Mesopotamia. In fact, it's the earliest flood boat. It's called a Mogwar. It's a cargo boat. It's also a deified ship. It's positioned in the southern region of the sky, and it's backwards turned. It moves uh, through the sky backwards turned, um, and it has its bow chopped off. Okay, in uh, a Sumerian scripture, the scripture is called Gilgamesh and Aga. So, this Mogwar boat is a deified ship positioned in the southern region of the night sky, according to the star atlases. Um, it's also a landing ship, uh, landing as in being beached. And when you beached, you were backwards turned in Mesopotamia because the Multu sign, which means constellation, can also mean to land a boat. And it has its bow chopped off in Sumerian scripture, right? So all of those correlate with Argo. You get deified ship constellation positioned in the southern region of the night sky. Um, 
it's backwards turned. Remember, I'm showing it as it appears on the Farnese Star Atlas. There, west is to your left. So it moves across the sky from east to west, backwards turned. How that came about is probably from this. You could write Mul Magor, the ancient Mesopotamian uh, cargo boat was a, a, a constellation, right? Mul Tu means constellation, but it also means uh, a medu, which can mean not only to place, but it can also mean to land a boat. Um, and Magor is this cargo ship. So you have a backwards turned ship. If you were landing a ship, you would have to turn it backwards so that the, the stern was leading as it went on to land. Okay. And so there you get, um, there you get a Mul Magor backwards turned ships. And that's why the the Argo is backwards turned. And I go into this into the um, in the article. I go into a little bit more depth with the wordplay. I didn't want to bore your viewers with all of the pun after pun after pun after pun. And by the way, in chapter four of the uh, um, the Celestial Code of Scripture, I do explain uh, how wordplay in Mul Magor explains the Argo's trip through the clashing rocks, the Simplagades. Um, so uh, anyway, th that's based on punning. And so you might say, well, okay, they're pretty good arguments for those absurd constellations showing up in the Mesop from Mesopotamia and reappearing uh, as a flying horse, as a ship constellation that's backward turned and missing its bow. Um, I forgot to say, uh, Magor, this, you get its bow chopped off. The word for stern in, uh, in Akkadian cuneiform is arku, it just means stern or back of an object. And arku, when you render it in, ar, into Greek, is argu. The, the Ks become Gs, and the long U sound, the ultra heavy vowel at the end of a, a cuneiform word is often rendered uh, as an. Uh, you, you know, an, uh, an omega. So you get Argu, you know, which is Argo. So uh, anyway, that's probably how it shows up. So you might say, well, how in God's name could Homer and Hesiod end up writing and knowing cuneiform? Well, many scholars have already testified to that. So uh, in the Oxford Classical Dictionary, uh, they describe Hesiod's Theogony, the origin of the gods. Uh, he writes that it has striking parallels in the Akkadian and uh, Hittite texts and seems originally to have come from the Near East. Peter Walcott, who writes extensively uh, re um, regarding uh, Hesiod's knowledge, or at least somebody was either tutoring him in cuneiform, or he knew cuneiform all by himself. He writes that um, the closest examples of Zeus, of Zeus in Theogony come from Marduk in the Numa Elish, which is the Babylonian Syrian creation myth. And he says that is, is to the Babylonian tradition in the eighth century BC that we should resort if we wish to assess Hesiod's depths, depth debt to the Near East. So what he's saying is, you know, somebody was either tutoring Hesiod when he wrote his theogony, theogony he, or he actually knew cuneiform. The best example, though, might actually be uh, come from Homer. So with Homer, Homer's name means hostage, right? So we know that there was the practice of hostage astrologers in the ancient world. The best example comes from is, is Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar II. He invades Judah. He takes in uh, Daniel, who's uh, an extremely skilled uh, scholar, and three of his countrymen. And Daniel goes on to become the, the supervisor of all the Babylonian astrologers and diviners, okay? And that's verified in Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, verse five, uh, chapter five, verse 11. So you, so you got Daniel, 
rising up to become the head of all the Babylonian astrologers. He's literally taken hostage. You have uh, Pliny the Elder writing slaves on sale that had been uh, imported from overseas. Instances of this being uh, Pub, uh, Publilius of Antioch, the founder of our, our mimic stage, and his cousin, Manilius Antiochus, the originator of our astronomy. By the way, they're, they're Syrians. They are taken from Syria, which is Phoenicia. So you have these probably Syrian scholars. Remember, Syria is a, is a hotbed of Mesopotamian uh, wisdom, occult literature and wisdom. And in fact, the Assyrians have control of the, uh, the Assyrians have control of the Syrian coast uh, during the eighth century BC. Um, Zenodotus of Malos, who's a second and first century BC writer, he affirms that Homer was a Babylonian. Homer means hostage. And just so you're aware, twice he describes seagoing Phoenician slave traders interacting with Greeks in the Iliad. And the Homeric hymns recount how the god Dionysius was uh, taken by pirates as booty while walking on the beach. One of the most intriguing examples of, you know, Homer being a hostage Babylonian astrologer comes from Lucian. So Lucian does this, you know, it's satire, but Lucian does this mock interview with uh, Homer and he says, above all, where do you, meaning Homer, come from? And he, he has Homer's answer. He writes, as a matter of fact, I'm a Babylonian and among my fellow countrymen, my name was not Homer, which is hostage, but Tigranes. Later on, when I was a hostage, Homer, among the Greeks, I changed my name from Tigranes to Homer, hostage, because I was taken hostage. And so what you probably have there is Homer being a hostage Babylonian astrologer. He knows the, how to read the heavenly writing of the stars. He knows Sumerian. He knows Babylonian. He knows, this, you know, Akkadian, which is Babylonian and Assyrian. And then he's taught Greek alphabetic writing. So M.L. West, who's a phenomenal classical scholar writes that Homer was not the name of a historical poet, but he was the fictitious uh, or constructed name. There was no original Homer. The Homerodi Hamer were not named after a person, but not knowing any better, they invented a Homer as uh, their ancestor or founder. And that name, hostage, gives you everything you need to know. Homer was a hostage a Babylonian astrologer taken hostage by the Greeks. And then he goes further, further. and M.L. West writes that, uh, I, you know, if they said, how did the trans, how did the poetic tradition pass from cuneiform to Greek? M.L. West spells it out for us. He says, I see no other alternative to the assumption of a certain number of bilingual poets, probably Easterners, meaning Mesopotamians, who had settled in Greece and learned to compose epic, uh, epic in the Greek manner. In other instances, we seem to detect clo close relationships between the Homeric hymns, Hesiodic passages, and other classic Babylonian texts such as Atrahasis and Enuma Elish. This is what uh, Professor McDonald is always talking about. He's he's connecting the uh, Genesis to this, but you can do it with other texts too. So um, to account for them, we must surely postulate poets educated in the Levant who subsequently became Hellenized and practiced in Greece. And uh, what I'm saying is, is this and the, the conclusion of that article, that how cuneiform puns inspired some of the bizarre Greek constellation asterisms. I conclude by saying Hasid's Mesopotamian astrology magicians disseminated uh, con conceptions of the starry sky as, as sacred cuneiform writing that divulged revelations through the medium of wordplay into the Hellenic uh, cultural sphere. During colloquies with Greek counterparts, 
these hostage Mesopotamian astronomers taught Hellenic neophytes the Mesopotamian constellation names and the technique used to extract revelatory puns from the stellar divinities as exemplified in the Numa Elish Tablet 7. Over time, a cadre of bilingual cuneiform Greek astronomer writers emerged. It, when, and it was this newly acquired Mesopotamian astrological arcana that equipped Greek astronomer poets with the ability to discover previously unknown attributes and qualities embodied in the ancient constellation gods. And that's how you end up with uh, a flying uh, golden fleeced ram. That's how you end up with a, a flying horse who's cut off at the navel. That's how you end up with a wine jug stationed on the back of the water snake. And that's how you end up with a backwards turned ballast boat that uh, travels backwards through the heavens. The book is the Celestial Code of Scripture. I do explore that in tablet four of the Celestial Code of Scripture, the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. And it's also in uh, the article, how cuneiforms puns inspired some of the bizarre Greek constellations and, and asterisms. It's a 2016 article in Archaeoastronomy and Ancient Technologies. So I hope that wasn't too pedantic to esoteric thoughts viewers. I hope I, I tried to simplify the, the cuneiform uh, writing system, which is incredibly complex and totally just laden with cuneiform punning. John, thank you. Thank you, Esoteric. Thank you for having me on. That was a lot of fun. And um, I hope your viewers uh, can uh, go back and you know maybe read the article or take check it out in uh, chapter four of my book. But uh, it's always uh, fun to be on Esoteric Thoughts and to share some of you know my studies and my passion with your viewers. <laughs>